<laughs> What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 77 of the Bros Talking Soccer Podcast. My name is Dave Knittle, here with my brothers Christian and Matt to discuss stories from around the soccer world. Matt? Hello. Christian? We are coming to you live from Sea Isle City, New Jersey. We are all together on, on a family vacation this Mother's Day. All, all the mothers out there tuning into this podcast, happy Mother's Day. We hope you're just having a swell day. And uh, all right, I think we are ready to go. Christian has our trivia question. I think I have my computer set up at this point, and we're good to get this get this thing rolling. Don't need that anymore. You ready? I'm ready. Oh, that's that's just swell and fantastic. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 77 of the Bros Talking Soccer podcast. My name is Dave Knittle, and I'm here with my brothers Christian and Matt to discuss stories from around the soccer world. Christian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave. Down here in Sea Isle City, New Jersey, enjoying the family vacation. First one we've done in almost 10 years 10 now, years, 8 yeah, to 10 years. Something like that. It's pretty crazy, and all of us are all together. It's it's really nice. I mean, now we're recording from a brand new location that we've never done before. Yes, it is the uh, bonus room at uh, my wife's parents' shore house. So uh, your in laws, yeah. the in laws, yeah, the in laws. We just watched the Premier League season finish on on four televisions. It's uh, it's an awesome setup here. Check out our Twitter account. Post a picture of that. I already did. So uh, check out the Twitter account for that. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for asking. I'm also excited to be on vacation with. Uh, Everyone here, you know, first time in a while, we all got to see uh, our teams do well this morning. Liverpool qualified, uh, Champions League, City got that 100 Ooh. points. We each, uh, so, yeah, we each all had good mornings. Yes, yes. City got that dramatic last uh, last second goal. Yeah, that was we, pretty nice. We do that on, uh, you know, the last yeah. day. It's good yeah. morning. Life is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm doing well, guys, too, enjoying the vacation as well. Got some sun today. Get a little break from the sun, which I think is a blessing in disguise. I think, uh, you know, I, I'm getting a little sunburned, so it, it's good to get the... Uh, well, red looks good on you, Dave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got, my, got my Liverpool jersey on. Christian, do you have a trivia question for this week? I do have the trivia question this week, Dave. It is, which team and how many times has have they gone unbeaten at home in the league? Okay. The most? Wait. Yeah, which team has done the <laughs> okay. most? That was not good phrasing. <laughs> okay. Which team has gone undefeated the most times at home in the Premier League, and how many times have they done it? Okay, all right. So we uh, will think on that, and we will let you know at the end. We'll give our guesses, and then Christian will reveal the answer. You give your guesses uh, and play along at home. That would be slow and fantastic. Before we get to our topics this week, want to give a mention to StadiumScene.com. We, uh, you know, if you're an avid listener of the podcast, you know about Stadium Scene. They are a travel blog and website for stadiums in the United States. So they have parking, they have bars, restaurants, what to do around stadiums before and after matches. So you want to go check them out if you're going to a game in the United States. Doesn't have to be specific to soccer, can be a bunch of other sports as well. Additionally, they partner with content creators like us, like other people who do podcasts, videos, blog posts, and so much more. Um, check them out at stadiumscene.tv. You can see all our stuff and a bunch of others. With that, let's get into our topics this week. You guys all right? I think somebody's here. He's here communicating upstairs. Okay. My mom and dad just walked in. That's yeah, fine. Okay. I'm sure they're going to be very quiet and uh, <laughs> not going to disturb us in any way. Let's get to the topics for this week. So big news broke fairly recently, at least in American circles, that Wayne Rooney is going to be leaving Everton at the end of the season and moving to D.C. United in MLS. Christian, what do you make of Rooney joining D.C.? Honestly, it's probably best for his career at this point. I think he's kind of burned out in the Premier League, and that level is just a little too high for him now. He started really well at Everton at the beginning of the season and really was playing better than we've seen him in the past three years at United. But he clearly at the second half of this year has just fallen out of favor and fallen out of form. And I don't know if he's ever going to get back to what he was. And I think in the MLS, he's going to be able to shine a little bit more. People are going to respect him a little bit more because of his name. And he does have talent that could improve the overall quality of the league. So you think he'll do well at DC? I think he will. You think he'll Even though DC are utter trash, I think he is going to give them a little boost. Okay. Front. Matt, thoughts here? Yeah, I think it's great for his career at this point. I think it's awesome. He got to go back to Everton, um, where he came up through uh, for his last season. He had a good like first half of the season. Uh, obviously, it didn't end well in Everton. You know, didn't have the best of years. But Rooney, at one point, was among the biggest stars in the world. Um, so, you know, American fans know him. 
um, or even not even that big of soccer fans. And he's just a big name to come to America. And I think that's going to be good for, you know, DC United, good for the MLS. And uh, another thing that's just annoying is just like the union can't get a player like that. Yeah. And it's just like frustrating seeing like more stars coming over and you know, Philadelphia not getting one of those top tier guys. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we, Torres and Iniesta might be coming over here. We're not going to get either of them either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would love Iniesta. I, I, oh, really? I could live without Torres. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I could live without Torres. But um, getting back to Rooney real quick, is there a price where it gets to be different? So Zlatan came over here for $1.5 million. That's, a, I think, a fantastic deal for LA. But if Rooney's making $5, 6000000 million, I don't know the financials of this particular deal, but does that change anything for you, Matt? Like, is there a cost benefit? Well, isn't that from the – well, he'll be a designated – Ibra's not a designated player. Correct. Right, so – I think it's fine if the league's paying for it. I don't think it's going to suffer. No, but so from a, does it make sense to either for the league or for DC United to pay him whatever? Like, is there a price where it doesn't make sense to pay him, or no? Is it just get his name I, over here? It doesn't matter. I think at this point, even at this point in his career, he's going to be one of the better players in the league. Okay. I, I'm still a little skeptical. I mean, if he's over here on a TAM deal, which is targeted allocation money, which is what Ebra's on, so $1.5 million a year, I think this is fantastic. But if Rooney's over here making 4 or $5 million, I just don't think he's worth that at this point in his career, as fantastic as he is as a player. Yeah, no, he's not going to be. He's not going to be Giovinco. He's not. That That is a whole different level of player that we've seen in MLS that we're not going to really see over the next couple of years. I hope we do. I hope we see some real star players starting to come through. But Rooney isn't going to be that. He's too old. He can't move. He can't run the whole game like he used to be able to. And even though he has dropped into more of a 10 or midfielder type of role, he's not going to be able to dictate the entire speed of a game. The way Giovinco can drop deep into it, can get forward, can attack a defense. He, he just isn't going to be able to provide that. But he will be able to provide a spark that DC really doesn't have. And especially them going into a new stadium to have that big name they just have a lot going for them right now if they're able to bring somebody like that in. Maybe that'll help bring more star players over to D.C. No, yeah, and they're kind of a sleeping giant because they were a powerhouse of MLS's early years, and they've just been struggling recently with you know, all the new ownership groups coming in, the fact that they don't play in their own stadium. But this may be they just got a new owner. I think he's a majority owner, at least a very large minority owner just, just came in and is injecting new money into the club. So, yeah, this may be a, a huge step and change in, the, in their strategy. So it's going to be interesting to follow there. Now let's talk about Rooney's previous club, Manchester United. So interesting tweet from I think it was Richard Jolly who tweeted out that the last three Manchester United, at least major managers, I don't know why, uh, what's his name, Moyes isn't on here. I don't know if that's just because he didn't make it two full seasons or, or what the deal is here. But Richard Jolly tweeted out that in, in Louis van Gaal's and Jose Mourinho, as well as Sir Alex Ferguson's two most recent seasons as, as Manchester United manager, there have been 11 0 draws under van Gaal. 10 0 0 draws under Mourinho and 0 0 0 draws under Sir Alex Ferguson. So, Matt, uh, does this is this indicative of anything? Is this a change in the way United's been playing? Does this mean anything to you, or is this just, I don't know, just an interesting stat that it's not much more to it? I don't think it means too much. Obviously, like Sir Alex was, you know, we've said it so many times, uh, he's the greatest manager ever. Um, his philosophy. For oh yeah, in the Premier League. In the Premier League. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Premier League. His um, you know, his tactics were completely different than uh, Jose Mourinho, who is very like defense rated. I think Van Hall, you know, you can or Van Gaal, Van Van Gaal, Van Hall. Oh, is anybody? Is there yeah, any preference? Whatever. There? I'm not gonna the other. whatever you want to call. Okay. Him. We, yeah, we know who yeah, you're talking about. I, I think even though maybe like Mourinho hasn't done much better in the table, I could feel like the culture when Van Hall was there wasn't great. Um, so maybe like the zero right now, I, I feel like it's getting better. Is it? Okay. Really? I mean, they came That's in second. It. I know they came in second, but the culture, I just feel they're like there's the, so much. Fans like, are already turning on Mourinho. They don't want to. They're in that. the ethic. I mean, that's only because city did so well. I don't yeah. think so. But look what he's, look what he's doing to Martial and Rashford. Like even I mean, Bogba. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. So yeah. Okay. Regardless. Irregardless. <laughs> irregardless. Right. irregardless right. Um. Yeah. So those two managers aren't really on the same level, and they have completely different philosophies than Sir Alex. And he was so attacking. He like inspired his, you know, his attackers to do so much. So, and with United, they and De Gea now. 
just keeping them pretty much in any game. Yeah. So a lot of those games could have been losses, I'm sure. So I don't put too much stake into the stat, but um, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it is interesting. My favorite thing, I, I don't know if this was proven. I, I may have just been an internet thing, but I remember reading at one point that Van Gaal forbid players from hitting shots first time in the box. They always had to take a touch. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that was in fact true, but I definitely remember reading that. And so I'm just regurgitating that. So there you go. Christian, your thoughts here on uh, this 0-0 zero, zero draws. This thing makes no sense to me, and I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Sir Alex Ferguson was at the end of 25 years in charge of Manchester United. That's what they're pulling. The last two years he was in charge. He had so much time to build those teams, and they were almost at the peak of their powers at that point. Yes, they were slowly starting to decline at that point, but they were still the champions when he left. I think it's not really fair to compare these two to him. Well, I think the reason that they're comparing is that they're similar players, right? Like the players that Sir Alex left for Van Gaal were kind of uh, of the same yeah. mold. Like I think that was the purpose of why the tweet you well, know, was structured that yeah, way. Yeah, but Sir Alex Ferguson was bringing in younger players when he left, and his – like rear guard was walking out. They were all older at that point. Was you, he bringing in younger players? I remember. Yeah, he brought in players like Ashley Young, Chris Smalling, Phil Jones. All of them came in his last year. Okay. And that was all a transition period, and he walked out in that transition period. So he left them with a team that was clearly not ready to challenge for the title, and you saw with David Moyes in his first year was not ready to take that challenge on. And I don't even think Sir Alex Ferguson would have won that year. He just it, it, that team wasn't good enough, and they ha they've been building ever since. And I don't know if they're ever going to get back to that level. They would need a manager who's able to do what Ferguson did over 25 years to obviously compete at that. Probably not for that long, but if they get someone for seven, eight years, that will, then you'll start to see that change again. But someone like Mourinho, someone like Van Gaal, they're just not that type of manager. They seem to go places and get their welcome worn out in three or four years. It happens all the time with those two. They're more pragmatic types of managers. The fans don't really love the style of play that you they are showing on the pitch every single time they step out there. And that's why you see these 0-0 zero, zero draws. Yes, they're getting grinding results when maybe it would have been a loss, but you're not going for the wins half the time. And well, it's exactly. tough to watch. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think that's what the point of the tweet is. It's that these managers, are they a right fit for touching on the culture of Manchester United? Should they be going after more somebody like Pep Guardiola? Should they have gone harder after him or somebody else who's more well, attacking focus? You know, yeah, they, they could have gone. They after did go after him. Pep. They could have gone after. They? Yeah. Klopp. They could have gone after yeah, a lot of different. Klopp attack. or Pochettino is another one they could have gone after. They really inspire a lot of attack-minded play, and they've gone after managers who are just grinding results. And yeah, they maybe finish second or third in the table, but they're not winning because of that reason. Their attacking play is not attractive enough yeah and i think that was the point of the tweet so i think we kind of uh, are in somewhat of an agreement there matt anything else you want to add here i still think the i mean the team that boys got was a title winning team so i think it's they were like old yeah but i mean there's a lot of old, you, your job is to bring in the new guys you want like that's he had a whole you know, he had time to bring in those people um I don't think if you if you're ever taking a team that knows how to win the Premier League, I I feel like it's kind of unfair to say they weren't good enough. Yeah, I don't think Moyes was the right appointment uh, just because he he's never he never managed in that type of scenario, a title winning team or anything like that. So I I don't think he was the right appointment there. But um, so I, like I also Sir don't Alex think he had the players because he knew he wasn't going to be successful. <laughs> no, maybe <laughs> it's like, see, you guys miss me. Like, that's probably what he did. He wasn't forced out though. Like, why would Sir Alex do that? Like, he wasn't like he was forced out. He made the decision. He just wanted to be remembered as the okay. only good manager ever. Yeah. That is probably what ended up happening. That brings us to the end. Unless Matt, you have something else to say, no. Christian? Anything else? No. That brings us to the end of our first segment. You're gonna hear a little bit more music, and then we're gonna talk to you very soon. All right. Anyone who's who happens to be watching uh, live, feel free to say hello. Um, let us know your thoughts on anything we talked about, and uh, if you got any questions or topics you want us to cover. What's up? You're about to say something. Uh, I was just gonna say. I was gonna say you're gonna miss me when I'm gone. And that yeah. would have been a good podcast. I was gonna say Sir Alex was a dick. Sorry. <laughs> but then with all the things that happened to him recently, I was like, I yeah. probably shouldn't say this. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, we we hope we wish him well. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
You're very close to me. I know. I'm purposely <laughs> doing that. I'm very warm. I'm sitting on your uh, seat. I, I know you are. I can I can feel it. Okay. We're all getting up in each other's hey. faces. We don't, I don't, we don't need to look at each other. I don't know why I have that up. I want to look at each other. <laughs> Get the fuck in. <laughs> all right. Careful. Careful. We, right. Got, we, yeah, got, we, got, we got electronics. We got water. Welcome back, everyone, to our second segment. Now let's talk about soccer on this side of the Atlantic, or uh, more specifically, the the World Cup bid for 2026 World Cup. So reading an article, which we'll, we'll tweet out and we'll link to in the podcast description, but it's from ESPN Soccer, or whatever the hell, they keep rebranding yeah. it. What is it? Is it just ESPN Soccer? It's not the soccer. isn't it? No, it's not ESPN FC anymore. I think they've rebranded. I didn't know but that. whatever, ESPN put out an article that in 2026... Um, I or I guess every World Cup vote, the hosting countries can't vote in the in the or bidding. Jesus Christ, I can't speak. The countries bidding to host the World Cup can't vote when it's being decided. Um, you know what? Actually, this is a new thing because they just changed. I'm I'm sorry, I'm putting all this together right now. They just changed the way voting works. Before it was an executive committee. Now everybody, every single independent country is voting in the FIFA election. So that's why this is happening. But Morocco brought up a point that countries that have ties to America, so Amer American Samoa, Guam, Puerto Rico, should be excluded from the vote because there's a conflict of interest. And so, Christian, I don't know if you – what are your thoughts on this? Is there a conflict of interest? What do you, does Morocco have a valid point here? What do you think? Uh, this is this is a weird one. Uh, I feel like these countries should be able to vote. Yes, there is a conflict of interest, but they are their own countries, yeah. regardless of the, their territories. They have a right to vote on where they think this competition should be played. Like that's just how it is, and I don't really think there's much anyone can do about it. Yeah, Morocco is going to be upset because they the U.S. own those territories, and most likely they're going to vote for the U.S. to have that World Cup, but. That's not really anyone's fault. That's just, I understand why they'd be upset. And I understand why the U.S. is saying, well, too bad. And FIFA is saying, well, that's just the way it is. Everyone just, that, that is how it's laid out right now. And you just kind of have to follow that, that path that they've laid out already. Any issues here for you, Matt? Um, I don't think, I don't have an issue with it. I think it's just unfortunate. Um, but is there any, like, benefit to, you know, like Guam, U.S. Virgin Islands, or having it in the United States, like how does that affect them? I think it's more like political, just like, you know, we're united, like we want to help you out, like we're all in this together type thing. It doesn't directly yeah. benefit them. But then you could say the same thing about like the EU, right? How they're all connected. Yeah, so to an extent, I mean, kind of. But I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of these countries like vote in blocks anyway. So I know yeah. a, a lot of times the, the CAF, so the African Confederation, will all the member nations will vote, you know, for one thing, so. Yeah, so I, I, I don't not putting much stock into this. I don't really care. I think it's just you know those territories are more than likely to uh, vote for the United States, and and I to be quite frank, it's just we deserve it more than Morocco, <laughs> in all likelihood. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I think I can kind of agree with that. The other thing is, I don't, I don't understand why the bidding countries are prevented from hosting or from voting, like. I, I don't understand why they would. Well, I mean, for this allowed. one, it makes sense because is there three? Be three countries oh, okay. voting for one versus just Morocco. Okay. You know, I can kind of understand that. But I don't know if this is, but are they going to always do this? I don't know. It's it's just so confusing. So Japan, thing. Korea, they wouldn't have been able to both vote for themselves. Well, I guess that now we're talking about before this was ever a rule, right? Back then. Well, it was I think a, that's ridiculous. If you guys agree that you want to have a World Cup, you should be able to vote for yourselves. Yeah. Irregardless. Yeah. Hey. Hey, yo. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I'm in agreement too. I, I don't, I mean, I kind of understand it to an extent that it, it might be an unfair advantage, but I mean, that's just like, there's all kinds of connections in, in the world, whether it's political, economic or whatever that tie you to certain countries. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think there, there's any difference here. So I, I don't think these countries should be forbidden from, from being allowed to vote, you know? So Matt, anything else you want to add? No. Christian? No. All right, MLS recently announced their, you know, twice a year they announce salaries for all of the players. The players union releases that data. I don't know exactly 
what the thought process is behind it. Um, I don't know if it's just transparency or or what exactly the reason is. But Matt, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on if you like that the league and the players union releases the salaries. If you put any stock in it, it is it helpful? Do you is it interesting? What do you think? Yeah, I, I really like it. Um, pretty much every American sport they release how much people are getting paid. It's you know how the fans can engage and you know really see like, what a player is worth. If you don't know how much your team is paying them, you're probably unfairly judging them. Um, so say someone who's not making a lot of money, you know, their benefit to your club is going to be different than someone's making, like say they even produce a little bit less. Jay Simpson on the union, yeah. right? We were talking yeah, about yeah, him yeah. just making $600,000 and he's never Seven. playing. What? Seven. Six hundred? Huh? So seven hundred thousand. Is it up to seven hundred now? Oh, All right. Close. Last year it was closer yeah. to six. So it's like those players. They maybe he's a little bit better than somebody making less, but you know, for our benefit and with salary caps in American sports and things like that, um, I feel like it's a great way for you know fans to really get on board and and be more engaged with how you know the club's actually doing. I agree with that, Christian. Your thoughts on salary data being released? I go back and forth on this one. I completely understand what Matt is saying, and I agree that it does help the fans absolutely understand how much you're actually paying someone versus how much they're producing on the field. You're able to weigh that balance. But I don't really understand the need because if someone released my salary at PayPal (laughs) – to like the whole company, I'd feel really uncomfortable about that because then you're comparing and it causes a lot of friction between you and your colleagues. If I was seeing what someone else who's doing the same job as me is making, and if they were making, let's say ten, twenty thousand $20,000 more than me, I would feel absolutely some type of way. And it would cause friction between me and my manager, me and my coworkers. I don't know if that's how it is in the sports world. It doesn't seem that way. I, I'm sure there are people who think, Hey, I'm just as good as them. Why am I not making that much? But it just seems a little unfair and unethical almost to to release that. It just seems a little weird that you'd be able to see what someone is bringing in in their salary. And then you compare yourself to them. And that's why I think we see a lot of these wage demand hikes and a lot of people are negotiating new contracts all the time. Maybe that would not be as high if you didn't know what someone else was making. but it's like a competitive sport. Like it's a competition. You should be competing against every other everything you are in should be competitive. And that doesn't mean you should see their salary. Like in, I'm in the accounting. I'm competitive with it's no, all you're other not, companies. You, you don't win anything. It's like you're competing to win a trophy. I win money and win promotions. So it's different. It's just a different way to look at it. You are competing. Yeah, it, it is. It's it, I can see both both sides of this argument. And also the other thing is like it's the players union that's releasing this de- this information. It's not data, data. I don't know the right way to you say it. You always say data. Data. No, you data? say data. You say data. data. It's data. It's data. Okay. Whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. It uh, the players union <laughs> is the one releasing this this information. Um it's not like the league is releasing it. So it's it's the players have agreed to release all of this. So it's not like, oh, you know, we have no say here. I mean, they're the ones doing it. So Clearly, they have some sort of benefit for it. And I think it is to what your point is to drive up prices and and wages so that they can compare um, on an even playing field. Because I think in that sense, if a person was making 10 to 20,000 more than you and you felt like you were doing more than them or deserved more, isn't that when you rather want to know that so you can push and say, hey, I deserve this? I guess, but I also see it from a management perspective that if you were releasing someone else's salary and you think that someone else is providing a different service and you don't think that other person is doing as well, but they think that they are, then it's going to cause friction. But, yeah, but there's also a lot of turnover in like sports, whereas like a company, you're not just going to be bouncing around from company to company. Like it is for the it sports. all the time. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't happen quite as frequently yeah. as, as sports, but yeah, I mean, people move companies. Um, mm-hmm. You know a decent amount and so yeah i mean i i, I can understand I, yeah i understand why they release it and i think it is good to know especially even from a different perspective people who are maybe thinking about going into that they are talented they're going through the youth academies they're possibly going to be professionals one day it's good to know what you'd be going into like at the start of your career what kind of salary you'd be making and thinking about it that way and thinking about okay so if i continue to improve what is the progression how much could i be making later and yeah, that's going up all the time and it is going to change. There's going to be turnover, but it's good to have that initial idea. 
for a lot of the younger people too. Yeah, and, and for me, I'm all about more transparency rather than less transparency. So I, I kind of like this. Matt, anything else you wanted to add? Are there like any sports where they don't release it? I don't, so I don't think American sports release it like, like the way that MLS does. It's reported on by reporters and it's leaked a lot of times by agents and or reported uh, officially yeah. by like a team. It's usually like, only like big players though when they release like, oh, they signed this contract for this amount over this amount of time. Yeah. And so that's I, usually what it is. I think that's yeah. what it is. So I don't know. I don't know for a fact. It may be that the league puts it out, but I, I don't think another league in America puts it out the way MLS does with like a, in a table and like you can like search and it's really, really just like made for people to go check it out. Like overseas, I don't think. Overseas, teams, it's really shady. When yeah. They do it. And it's There's just like random things, reports yeah. and they all say different things. Well, exactly. Well, it's really bizarre overseas because even the transfer fees, it says undisclosed half of the time and you don't even know how much it was. And I don't really understand. Well, because they don't have to disclose it exactly right? so it's like which i also don't mind i think that's fine to do yeah i personally like it more transparency because like yeah, again it's, it's a way for you to evaluate properly all right if i paid a million dollars for this player versus 10 million dollars for this player i mean that's going to influence yeah, what i think of the 10, more, 10 times more productive yeah to an extent yeah. and so i think that it is important to kind of have that information so right. that's kind of where where i fall out matt anything else you want to add no christian all right, brings us to the end of our second segment. You're going to hear a little bit more music, and then we're going to be back with our end-of-season reviews on Premier League and Bundesliga. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Irregardless? Is that what, is that what yeah, we're calling like this episode, man? All right. Uh, anything else we want to add? You trying to spit in my drink? We'll talk about this, too. Oh, good. Yeah, we can talk about that. Uh, so, do you want to do the Bundesliga first? Yeah, sure. I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> because it was delayed. <laughs> It's a little delayed. <laughs> no, still no chats. Why is nobody on the chat? <laughs> Welcome back to it. Episode? Yep, I know. <laughs> Welcome back to our third and final segment. We decided to take this last segment and just talk about the Bundesliga and Premier League since those two leagues wrapped up this weekend. Uh, we're going to talk Bundesliga first. So uh, I don't know if we have, do you want me? To, I'm not going to run through through the table, but let's talk about obviously it's Bayern. Bayern yeah, yeah, let's let's talk about that. But obviously Bayern won the title and then Schalke, Hoffenheim and Dortmund finished in the Champions League spots and uh, Hamburg and Köln got relegated while Wolfsburg is in the relegation playoffs. So, Christian, any surprises, thoughts here on the uh, table? I really just want to throw – well, I'll start with that, yeah. I Bayern is ridiculous. I don't understand how they win so convincingly every year, and especially going into that last day, they just were not performing, lose 4-1. To a team that finished seventh, they're not a bad team, but – for a team like Bayern Munich at home to be kind of embarrassed the way they were, even with their star players playing, it was a little bizarre. I don't, I don't really like that. But uh, Schalke really impressed me this year. The fact they finished second, I really didn't expect that at all from them this year. I think they're a really good club that usually are always in the top half around the Europa League, maybe bottom half of the Champions League type of positions. But second is really good for them, and I'm I'm really excited to see what they can do in the Champions League and. Got a How lot they of can Americans. From here. Yeah, Good for you. Got a lot of Americans, <laughs> and they got that young manager. Exactly, he's really young. And Hoffenheim is another one who has another young manager. Yep. And he's doing a great job at Hoffenheim. They came in second a couple of years back. I think that was before he came in. They sold a lot of their players. Firmino's to Liverpool now. I know he was one of their star players. Was player of the year in the Bundesliga, I think, or one of the top three, something like that that year. And. He like they are still up there. They're still competing. Yeah, they had a little bit of a dip, but they never really wavered that far down. They were never really bottom half, really competing with relegation. He's gotten them very balanced. And the fact they finished third, they don't have to go through qualifying, which they did this year, lost to Liverpool. It's unfortunate we had to lose a Bundesliga team or a Premier League team in the qualifying, but we won't see that again. So no, that's really yeah. nice. <laughs> and Dortmund's another one who I'm really excited to see in the Premier League. Champions League. Premier League, yeah, yeah and that makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> they're always very talented. And having a kid like Pulisic out there is going to be really nice. Yeah, he's got the sleeve tat now. The, the biggest surprise, though, is just from, what is it, ninth? Yeah, from ninth to second, or ninth to third, there's only an eight-point gap. 
No. That's crazy at the end of a season. Yeah, I know. And that's really exciting to see. Yeah, Matt and I were watching the the final day of the Bundesliga down here um, and just following it. Christian wasn't. I was here, yeah. I was oh, here Friday man. night and I was here watching it with them and Dave just pretends like I don't exist. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I got here yesterday. I'm no, sorry. All the days in. are he's blurring in together. That's yeah. why. Okay, the days of blurring together, and I drank a lot this last week, so um, and I don't really drink too much anymore. So I apologize, Christian. But we were we were here watching watching all this and and the changes that were happening and, and following along. So it was it was very interesting. Matt, your thoughts here on on the Bundesliga? I mean, any surprises for you or whatnot? Uh, yeah. Before you get into that, I just want to say like their last day because everything was so close was so interesting. Uh, Unlike, you know, the Premier League where almost everything was set in stone before the matches started. Well, except um, for the Chelsea-Liverpool uh, sort of battle. but that, Yeah, but that was a long shot yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, but I'm saying like there was a lot going on in the uh, German. There was goals everywhere in the Bundesliga. Um, so th- that final day was incredible to watch. Um, but, you know, Bayern running away with the league again. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know when... They're not going to win again. Uh, yeah. So, so I yeah I don't know. Something's going to have to happen where Leipzig is going to have to seriously circumvent the the rules in the Bundesliga with sponsorship and just pump a ton of money in there. But it doesn't seem like they they want to do that. Like it seems like they're perfectly content just with their strategy. So I don't know what's going to happen to unseat Bayern. Like I, yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Wolfsburg oh. um, finishing in that uh, relegation playoff spot. That's just surprising. Uh, the money they have and you know the players they've had, they, even the big names they have still, yep. and yep. the players they've sold and the money they've gotten from that. It's, it's crazy to see them come in 16th in the Bundesliga. Um, so that, that that was pretty surprising. Uh, the uh, Hamburg. Yeah. What about the, the Hamburg yeah, situation where they uh, just started lighting their field on fire, basically the fans. And now I was just sad to see how the fans reacted on the last day. And it was before the match was even over. It was just it was just sad to see you know fans just kind of disrespecting the club and you know being in that top flight for that long is such an accomplishment. And the reaction from the fans it was just kind of. Pettier. Yeah, petulant, petty, and and I and it probably is a it's a subsection of the fans because we yeah. while we were watching yeah. like and the players came back out onto the field there was a ton of fans that were cheering and were supportive and so a lot of times as there is in most things it's a small few that kind of give the rest of the people kind of a bad name but for anybody who doesn't know Hamburg's been in the Bundesliga since it started in 1963 this is their first ever relegation from that there were leagues before uh, the Bundesliga and I'm not sure if they had been relegated from anything prior but since the Bundesliga started in the early 60s uh, Hamburg has not been relegated so the fans did not take it well Christian anything else you want to add about the bottom of the table or yeah, anything? It was just interesting the way that Fox showed it too it was nice that they had all the games on Fox Fox Sports 1 and Fox Sports 2 but again it was nothing compared to the Premier League showing all 10 games it was nice to see that they showed a bunch of them and they were following along with what was happening in the other games they were giving people updates giving live tables I thought they handled it pretty well for what you expect Fox to show soccer yeah. recently. It hasn't been great, but the way they showed Hamburg's relegation after the game with like that video with the clock ticking yeah. and then they just, it, they, so Hamburg in their stadium have a clock ticking of all the time. They have not been relegated and it's up to what, almost 60 years, something like that. Yeah. And in the video, they just have a click and all of a sudden it's zero. And it was like really dark. And, no, we, and just, then it cr- we all just looked at each other. And we're, well, then it like, cut. It faded into like a, the picture of Hamburg, and then it had the date nineteen sixty three to yeah. twenty eighteen. Yeah, like, and like oh, almost like they were yeah. dead. Like yeah. almost like the club died. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, and then the field's on fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was an interesting package that that Fox put together there. But the announcers were kind of talking about sometimes it does help clubs to get relegated. Like you saw what happened and what Sunderland is going through right now. It's a product of them not being relegated over so many years. They just papered over cracks. And then what happens is eventually they all sort of blow up and you can drop all the way down the way Portsmouth did, all the way down to the fourth division. And Sunderland is on that trajectory. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, or or in other instances like um, Newcastle or Burnley, they came up with a plan. They were okay with being relegated and they were able to bounce right back up. But um, so maybe this might be good for Hamburg if they don't keep, papering over cracks and things like that they can really reset and build a stable foundation so 
I know you were giving me a face. Do you not agree with Did that? Did Portsmouth not get forced into the fourth division immediately? No. I thought they were. Okay. No, I think they, they went through a bankruptcy type thing, and, yeah. and they didn't immediately go to the fourth division, but because they were dealing with all of that, they couldn't invest in the club. Yeah. And so Port, Portsmouth is probably not a great example, but I know Wigan went through this recently where they dropped they straight down. And, yeah, they were yeah, they coming back up, Yeah, but they're bouncing back. But all I'm trying to say is Bolton that – Bolton did it. There's been a lot of clubs. Blackburn, I think, also did it. It's, yeah. It's crazy. And Fulham almost got relegated a second season in a row. They're in the championship playoff now, but that's crazy. Yeah, so sometimes relegation isn't always the worst thing if you handle it in the right way. So, you yeah, know, we'll be following. Build from the bottom up again. Exactly. Yeah. Matt, anything else about Bundesliga? Uh, no. Christian? Nope. All right, let's talk Premier League now. So, again, we were we were following that this morning before we talk specifically about the Premier League. Uh, we gave our predictions of what would happen before the season, and we uh, – you know, tweeted them out from our from our Bros Talking Soccer Twitter handle at BT Soccer Pod. Go follow us there. And so I uh, wanted to give an update on how the season kind of finished out. I don't exactly know how we want to do this, Christian. Do you have thoughts? I know you have your list here, but um, how do how do we want to present this to the listeners? I got it. I'm ready. Okay, so Christian's gonna give I'm gonna you take over here an update here. All on right. What so we all made our predictions. The way that it works is that we did. If you got the position correct for the team. It was five points for every position it was off. You lose a point. So if there were five or more positions away, you got zero. Matt ended up winning. He got 56 out of the 100 points. That's very well done, Matthew. Oh, wow. Thank you. Uh, going into last night, though, he had 57 points. He did lose one today, but he ended up holding off Dave, who made a charge. Made a little bit of a charge at the end. I think he got Dave got two more points, and Matt lost one point. So it did close the gap a little bit, but it wasn't – wasn't the end of the tried. world, and I you just couldn't. But for those of you watching on YouTube, bro, we couldn't find paper, so we found a paper, paper towel, towel and, and a sharpie. sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what that's what we're working with. We'll tweet that out. All right, so there. yeah, okay. So the way that uh, it ended up is Dave ended up with fifty three points. Dave also dominated the top half of the table, had thirty five points up there, and then just utterly collapsed yeah. in the bottom half of the table. Yeah, I got that very Did wrong. Did not get it very close. Yeah. 53 points. It's not bad, though. Thank Still you. over I half. Try. I try. I had 47. I also had 47 yesterday, so it made no difference today. Nobody moved. It was great. It was perfect for me, and congratulations, Matt. Oh, wow. Thank Good you. Job. Thank Matt you. actually had the lowest score on the top half of the table. Yeah. 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 I but got a... West Brom came through big for you, right? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, but let's talk. Let's talk about specifics now. Now with the with the table. So, Matt, um, any surprise? Uh, so obviously, City won. United came yeah. in second. Liverpool third. Liverpool nope. nope. Tottenham third. Liverpool fourth. So that's your Champions League. Chelsea, Arsenal, Burnley are going to be in the Europa League, mm -hmm. and then Swansea, Stoke, and West Brom have been relegated. So, Matt, I don't know your thoughts on a any surprises for you. Any anything you want to highlight here in the table? Yeah. Well. One thing I want to highlight is I got a lot of shit all year for uh, picking Everton to come fourth, and I still had the best table. So uh, that was just something I had to deal with all year. Um, they disappointed me. I thought, you know, the money they invested and the players they got were going to be better um, and be, you know, just perform a little bit better, but they did not have a great year. Um, the top four. They were only 26 points back of fourth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the top four. <laughs> Um, so I think they you that's, each predicted Liverpool not to make the Champions League. So I mean, now I looking fifth, back, right? yeah, you had them fifth, and Christian actually had them sixth. No, no, Christian had them fifth. You had them sixth. That's Matt. correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I also predicted Arsenal to be seventh. Better. Um, I expected them to rebound, especially because they went through that long period of qualifying for the Champions League. I thought Arsenal was gonna, you know, change the club back to what they were, but you know, his time was up, and you know, that's just the culture. It's soccer. It happens, but you know, hopefully. Arsenal aren't going to you know, fall, fall apart. Um, it's going to be a huge culture change, but uh, hopefully they don't, you know, go down or go back to like, be like bottom beat. of the tape. Not go down, but I'm saying like in, in years. <laughs> I like, think you know, it's going to be like different a, than Sir Alex when he left. I think Wenger right? isn't leaving that big of a impact the way that Sir Alex did when he left. Uh -huh. I think Sir Alex was leading a championship winning team that was aging Wenger's team he actually has there. There's a lot of talent there right now that and, could be successful. And, and if they bring someone in who can use those of the players together in the right system, they're going to be really difficult to beat. I don't think Arsenal has that much talent. I think Wenger gets a lot of 
credit. Like, he doesn't get a lot of credit for help. He went he went I to mean, the qualifier for Champions League with Bettner and Shamak as his two strikers. Yeah, and also, I mean, their like goalkeeper six or seven situ- years. Yeah, their goalkeeper situation is a nightmare. Their defenders. I mean, outside of Bellerin, I mean, who won that? Bellerin's really like Montreal's been very and Bellerin's yeah, like okay, Montreal. I'll give you, but a lot of their center very very good. Arsenal Arsenal and Mustafi was very good. Used to be. I don't know what happened to Mustafi. Because Shelny and his and his Achilles just tore. So I know. Yeah. You, you might not. You never, especially what is he thirty? Yeah. Now you like when you tear your Achilles at that age, you, you don't come back the same. Yeah. No, you're you're 100 percent right. And so Bellerin this year, because I'm friends with uh, some Arsenal fans, so like they're they think he's the worst yeah. of their defenders. Oh, so uh, yeah. So I mean, historically he had been of talented. I don't know what's going on yeah. now, but to Matt's point, I think that there is an element of you know that the roster isn't quite as talented. But Christian, to your point about not leaving them quite in the same position, Sir Alex left. Arsenal has already been transitioning this year. They brought in a I, I don't. I don't know what to call it, like a GM type position from Dortmund, the guy who used to be at Dortmund and was great at recruiting and all of that. So previously, Sir Alex did everything at Manchester United and Arsene Wenger had a similar situation in Arsenal, but they've already slowly sort of transitioned that and and were planning ahead a little bit to this moment. So I don't think, you know, I I agree with you. I don't think there's going to be quite as much of a transition, but your thoughts here on on the table and and yeah, uh, I think Man City was clearly going to win from the beginning. All of us had them winning. They were clearly the best squad, best manager. That's just who they are. Yep. I just am a little surprised throughout the season that United finished second. I honestly am. I don't think that they play a great style of soccer as we discussed earlier. Um, Tottenham, as we discussed last week, we gave our little predictions on what we thought it was going to end last podcast. I said Tottenham would finish third and Liverpool fourth. That's not really surprising to me. I, I think that those four teams were the best teams over the whole season, and they should be in the Champions League next year. Uh, Chelsea had the slip that I think pretty much all of us predicted that they would have. Yep. They have not been great after titles for the last two times they've won, and it's it was awful to watch them this year. They were not very talented. Arsenal, again, we've discussed, they're going to grow back. They're, they're going to be competitive in the, in the coming years when they get a team that uh, can come together. And with Lacazette and Aubameyang and Ozil, they, they have such attacking creativity that they have to score goals. And if they can bring in someone, uh, even someone like Simeone, I don't think he'll come yet, but someone like that who can get them organized at the back with that attacking talent, he doesn't even need to play attacking soccer. No, I don't be... know about that because that's Jose Mourinho, right? The same thing happened with United. It was they had all this attacking talent. You bring in somebody who is more defensive I... focused. I think you. I would worry if they brought in Simone. Simeone. Simeone. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think they need to do something that's different than Wenger, though. And Wenger was more of an attractive style of play. And I think defensively, they're an absolute joke. Yeah, I think they have good players there. But they seem like they didn't want to play for each other. They didn't want to play for the manager this year. And maybe that is why they weren't as good. Yeah. But, they, they, they say, like, in interviews, they don't like being there. Like, Courtois and yeah. Hazard, they're saying, like, Chelsea. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> that happens uh, as well. Also, we kind of we kind of glossed over like City had a record breaking year. I just wanted to highlight they got a hundred points. Is that what you were just about to do? No, I was going to say some other stuff, but yeah. Well, I just want to okay. just throw this out and then I'll come right back to you. But City had a record breaking year. I think they scored the most goals ever, one hundred and six goals for. Did they have the highest goal difference as well? I think it was one of the highest goal differences I think ever. It, 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 and they got 100 points, which is the record uh, in all of English soccer since it started in, what, the late 1800s, uh, at least, yeah. you know, the, the football league started. So, you know, just want to take our hats off that probably one of the best teams, you know, ever. And so uh, so congrats to them. Christian, sorry. Uh, I just want to give credit to Burnley for finishing seventh. I think it's awesome they're going to be in the Europa League. But I think other than going that, down. So did yeah, I. I, I think we all did. All yeah. three of us had Burnley <laughs> going down. So congratulations, Sean Dyche and yeah. that entire club. That's really impressive that you were able to prove a lot of people wrong this year. Yep. Uh, the biggest uh, upset, I think, in my opinion, the Swansea going down in terms of they lost their last five games in at a least. row. Yeah, at least. Yeah, and that's all least, we can see yeah. in this table uh, but, that we're looking at. Uh, that is horrendous. And if you had any hope of escaping – it looked like they were good at one point. Losing that many games in a row just shot their entire season. And even coming in the last two games, they had two home games. One against Southampton, one against Stoke. Those two teams are 17th and 19th in the table. Oh. They lost both of them. 
Yeah. Well, one they of do. them also had to go down, if you think about it. Because then you're going to probably say the same thing about Southampton losing to Swansea. I mean, somebody but, has to lose. But yeah, even but, Southampton, they had a draw and a win in their last games. Other than that, they, they were fighting. They wanted to get out of it, and Swansea just looked like they were helpless. I think Southampton's a better team. I agree with that. And also, Swansea dug themselves a hole earlier in the season. Yeah. It looked like they stabilized under the new manager, but then they kind of reverted back. They also had some unfortunate injuries, like Boney going down after they spent a ton of money on him. That that certainly didn't help. So, and um, I forgot about uh, Crystal Palace and their start to the season. Yeah. And they almost reached top half of the table. Yeah, that was pretty, that's absolutely incredible. Um, so, yeah, hats off to, to Roy Hodgson and Crystal Palace. Um, I think we all agree. Like, they had the talent to, to be mid-table. It was just after yeah. that horrendous start. Um, that was horrible. would have assumed they were definitely going down. But, yeah, zero goals and zero wins in, in the like first six. seven matches. Oh, yeah, seven. Yeah, and they lost them all. So, pretty incredible stuff. And then they beat United, right, or Chelsea, one is of that, the two. That, that was their it? first win. I think it was Chelsea. Chelsea. I think yeah. it was Chelsea. Seems like a Chelsea loss. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but the, another just big shot, I, I, none of us had Stoke really below the top half, maybe just slightly, but most of us had yeah. them easily staying in the league and losing a team so with stable. that stability, yeah, that stability and the talent yeah. that they have is really shocking. They have one of the best goalies in the league, in my opinion. I think Jack Butlin is really good. Shakiri is a really great player on the wing. Jeff they, Cameron. Jeff Cameron is, yeah, just great. Um, <laughs> No, they, but they have, they the have a lot yeah. of good players on that team. Peter Crouch is an absolute legend of the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's just it's sad to see a club like that walking away from the league. They have such good players, and I wonder if a lot of them are going to leave cheap this summer. I would imagine so. Yeah, oh, that's tough I for them to imagine read them. Yeah. playing in the championship. Yeah, there's like a three percent chance he ends up playing in the championship. Yeah, I, I cannot see that. I was listening to the the analysis a couple of weeks ago after some of the games and they were saying a lot of people when they join teams that are in trouble and they're quality players, they'll have something in their contract yeah. that says I can be released for this yeah. price. They said a lot of those players don't have that because they didn't expect it to come to this. So it'll be interesting to see. Maybe they're forced to stay and they'll come right back up, but I can't imagine that they're going to be forced to play in that well, division. Yeah, if they don't have those release contracts, uh, clauses in their contract that means that they kept their wages the same yeah, so it's yeah, going to be in exactly. stoke's best interest yeah. to offload them in, in all likelihood matt i felt like you wanted to say something a little bit ago well, did you or no if not uh, no worries no all right but matt did bring up before we before we close things out here i did want to just highlight one thing as we were watching like the Bayern game and even city to an extent um just the way European soccer and just soccer a lot of times is decided where it is anticlimactic. Yes, it is most fair because over the course of the season, you know, the best team ends up winning. But that meant City clinched the title, you know, almost a month ago and Bayern clinched it almost two months ago. And so you had these weird scenes where Bayern lost uh, their final match of the season, but then they still they got Celebrate. spanked at home. But they yeah. but then they celebrated and it was this whole weird dynamic. And you even talked about City. Yeah, we yeah. Well, one, we won the title in a game on a day we weren't even playing. Yep. Um, my company was at a, like a bunch of his the players. House. Yeah. No, no, I think they were at like a pub. They were all, too. Really? Those no, he was, yeah, he was at his house with like his family. There was just a camera crew there. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So like it was kind of, uh, and then you're just like supposed to celebrate like you won. It's not the same as like, I know like for us sports, like you win the ch title like in a championship game or something like that. Yeah. I like, guess what you kind of imagine sports. Like how Liverpool especially. when they beat you. Beat Madrid. Yeah, sure. Exactly what it's like. Yeah, or like, like, but then the opposite side is when City clinched the title, like the most dramatic title ever. That yeah. was pretty incredible. Yeah. But would you want more moments like that, you know, where there, there's an action that happens late in a match well, or something? Yeah, but then, then again, that's why you do have those cups. Cups and finals. So, yeah, I know. It's just an interesting sort of different dynamic. And so, but it, but it was, oh, I just wanted to And also, it yeah, like um, even like the trophy celebration yeah. where like City drew nil-nil. And it was like a pretty boring game. And then you're just supposed to like celebrate that and Byron getting spanked at home and then just throwing beer on each other. It's just like, it's kind of just weird. Yeah, but I can also understand the trophy celebration. If it's the last match of the season, like Byron, that made sense. Or like City, yeah. it wasn't even their next home match or the last match of the season. It just seemed to be somewhat randomly picked. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't understand when the Premier League decided to like do the trophy presentation because it was just after like we had another home game, we had more games to play. It was just like, all right, we're just gonna do it today. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I 
I, mean, I think we're just I almost airing they, our grievances. Yeah, yeah. I thought I that know. they always do. The last home game of the season is when they do that. Is it the last home game? That's what they usually do. It's not the next one. No, <laughs> but it seems like City. But what if happen. you're? But what if you're away, like on the last day? Well, then they do it there. It's where they'll have multiple. If it comes down to that, hmm. they'll have multiple sets, which is yeah, yeah, of, yeah, multiple yeah. trophies at different yeah, places. Yeah. yeah. That's standard, though. Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, but what do they do with the spare ones? <laughs> Donate them Burn to them. Africa. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Anything else? No, I, that was a joke because um, <laughs> they make spare, donate them donate to them, them to Africa because uh, like the Super Bowl <laughs> champions, they always yeah. have two two sets of T-shirts made, and so like this year the Eagles won, so all the Eagles players got got their shirts, but all the Patriots merchandise ends up getting donated to like Africa or Asia, like underprivileged shirts, like underprivileged communities shirts. who have like clothing <laughs> with all this with all this stuff that like didn't actually happen. Shirts. Underprivileged shirts, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, Christian, uh, Christian, anything else you want to add here? Any nope. other, any other topics? Uh, I wanted to say, uh, congratulations to Miroslav Kloza. Mm-hmm. He's got a job in the Bayern Youth Academy now. He's a coach. I really loved him as a player. Oh, he's yeah. one of my favorite strikers of all time. And I hope he's successful and we get to see him as a manager one day. I've only had, I think two or three soccer jerseys with players' names on the back. It's just something I don't do. He was he's number he was 11, That's number why. 11, close for, for Germany. So I, I, I always have, uh, Soft spot in my heart for him. Matt, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I'm surprised you guys didn't touch on this, but Sala broke the goal record. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that happened. Yeah, yeah so. That's awesome. Yeah, he broke the Premier League goal scoring record, so good for him. And that was goal scoring record in a 38 match season in the number of matches that he scored. He scored 32 goals in 38 um, matches. So That's crazy. Yeah, awesome stuff for him. Christian, do you want to recap our trivia question? Yeah, trivia question is there has. Nope. That's definitely not what it is. Start, I always... like just scripting this out. So, so you actually No, remember. it's more fun this way. Okay, all right. <laughs> try, try to articulate. Which, <laughs> which team has had the most seasons with undefeated home record, and how many times have they done it in the Premier League? Okay. Matt, you want to give your guess? Undefeated home record. Um, it's either United or Arsenal. Um. I'm going to say United, and they did it. So we're doing the Premier League since, like, the 80, whatever. Premier League started in 92. 92. Okay, yeah. Um, Say United did it five times? That's a good guess. I I believe it's Liverpool with seven. Um, I wasn't listening totally earlier, but I know Christian looked at me after after they said it, and so – it was Liverpool with seven. Yeah, I, thought, I, I kind of heard it, but wasn't really paying attention. Yeah, the but, stat um, came up during the final day. If you're tuning in on NBC, but United probably does have five or six. So that would be my guess too. I think they're pretty good at home, so that's a good guess as well. Listeners, hopefully you got that that answer as well. Oh, what they, is surprising? They, they, and they've never won the Premier League. They're bad away from home. Yeah, and they're always recently. losing against just the like mid table yeah. clubs. Yeah. They also draw a lot of home games that United would win. Mm. Yes, good point. Interesting. Until recently, how United's drawing 0 0 at home. All and the now time. we're dominating. Yeah, we're just bringing this whole full thing circle. full circle. That, that brings us to the end of the podcast. As always, we will have links to all the stories we discussed today in our podcast show notes. So please go check them out. We'll also tweet them out from our Bros Talking Soccer Twitter handle, which is at BT Soccer Pod. If you want to get in contact with us, our email is bros.talking.soccer at gmail.com. We also have a website, bros talking soccer podcast.com, where you can read about us, check out past episodes, and so much more. We record this thing live on YouTube, so search the Bros Talking Soccer YouTube channel on there. We'll link to that in the podcast show notes as well. So go watch us on there. And finally, we have been working really hard on this thing for about a year and a half now. It would really mean a lot to us if you left a review. So please, on your podcasting platform of choice, go leave a review for us. We would really, really appreciate it. Matt and Christian, this was a lot of fun. I think this will be the last one we all do together for a little bit of time. So I had a good time. It was good being with you guys. And uh, it was all, all right. right. Yeah, we'll be we'll be together mm-hmm. soon, you know, in our hearts and minds. So listeners, thank you for being here, and we will talk to you soon. Say, everyone. Happy have Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Right. You uh, you have Sharpie on you from that paper towel. Yes. And on what me. are you trying to cover yeah. my mouth for? On your I'm hand speaking. and your elbow. What are you talking about? You have Sharpie on your inside of your hand. Right here. Outside, right here. Outside. Right here. And your elbow. 